John, the first question that I've been asking a lot of people, and I don't mean this as a throwaway question, but to try to understand kind of what people were like, what were you like growing up? What were your interests and uh, how would you describe a, a young John Blake? Boy, I mean, I was not uh, going way back. I was not what you would call the model child. Uh, I was a, uh, I was not a real, uh, I was kind of a discipline problem to my parents, uh, through my first, uh, I don't know, till, uh, till I got to high school, I guess. I was one of those kids, you know, that always sat in the front of the room with the, by near the teacher. Um, so, so because I created so much, uh, mischief, um, so from that perspective, uh, you, you know, I was not, uh, I had I was uh, kind of a juvenile delinquent to a certain extent, um, but you know beyond that, obviously sports were, were, were my history in sports. I really liked uh, even as a as a kid, I liked history. I mean, I learned how to, I uh, I got a real uh, you know fat infatuation with with the presidents when I was in third grade. And, and I've been able to, you know, say all the presidents in order backwards and forwards since I was in third grade. So, so it's kind of, and then, and then obviously a lot of sports. I wasn't a particularly gifted athlete, but I played football, basketball, baseball. Was a huge uh, uh, Boston sports fan. Uh, Bruins, Red Sox, Celtics. And the New York Giants instead of the Patriots because uh, I went back. I'm so old that I go back to kind of the AFL days when uh, the NFL was still king. And the Giants were still very big at that time in New England. What drew you to sports as a fan? As a fan? Um, I think like a lot of probably kids, my my father was, was a huge baseball fan. He was a Yankees fan, so... He grew up, uh, you know, in, in New England when the when the Red Sox were very good. A lot of time, very good, and the Yankees were. So he, he was a Yankees and a Pirates fan. Um, and uh, you know, I, I was I, I probably played basketball more than any other sport. You know, youngster, so I became more of a of a certainly an NBA fan. And then I played a lot of football, and uh, it just you know. But again, I think a lot of it was uh, came from that. You know, I mean, as a kid, you know, I started collecting baseball cards, which, you know, really, I think, helps your identity in the sport. You can name, you know, I can still name the lineup from, you know, teams in the 60s, probably better than I can teams now. And it's just things like that. And so that's kind of how I, I kind of grew into that. So, okay, you mentioned, like, your your ability to, to name things. I I think one of the things that strikes me, is your recall. I mean, you can, and I don't know, maybe, maybe it, it's not as easy with the more recent stuff, but like the ability to go decades back and remember something like it was yesterday. Have you always like growing up? Was that always a strength? Uh, yes, it really was. And it was, you know, when I got to college, you know, it was easier for me. And when I, when I got to college, you know, I was very, I had a lot of other jobs other than just academics and the course, you know, and I and my and I was able to get pretty good grades by taking courses where the final exam meant a a big part of the weight of the grade because I was so I, I could memorize so well. So I, I had a, I had a I had a really good capacity, for like for a final, to be able to to memorize a semester's worth of material, you know, and do well on a final, and then just move on to the next final and, and kind of do the same thing. So yeah, that. That has always been something, uh, and again, as you get older, it, it's not there quite as much. But yeah, that's definitely, and it certainly has helped in, in you know in my career. All right, so you go to Georgetown after some time at, at boarding school. Uh, when you went to Georgetown, did you know you wanted to get into sports? Did you go there with like a focus of this is what I want to do, or did it just kind of evolve while you were there? I. Uh, I had no clue this is what I wanted to do when I went to college. I, you know, I mean, again, in, in high school, I, 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 academically, it was government history, those kinds of things that were my strength. I was not great in math and sciences. Um, 
and I thought, you know, and I thought that was a route I, I, I wanted to go. Uh, you know, I was going to major in government, uh, history, international politics. And so those were the kind of programs that I was looking for when I applied to college. And Georgetown School of Foreign Service uh, is one of the best programs in the country for that. And uh, somehow I got into Georgetown and, uh, you know, and majored in international politics. But, but I had no idea, uh, Jared, that these, that these kind of jobs really even existed when I was in high school. It was, you know, I, this was the mid-'70s. Um, both athletic departments and front offices of professional sports teams were incredibly small. And th- th- there was not a lot of, of jobs out there. And, you know, when you're, when you're 18, 19 years old in the, at that time, you know, he just had no idea these kind of jobs even existed. So, you know, when I went to college, again, I was looking to, you know, major in government history and maybe go to the Foreign Service, School of Foreign Service. That was kind of the, I guess, the career path I was at least looking to. And it just kind of evolved in college. I remember the first week I was, uh, I was at Georgetown you know, looking for something to do, because in boarding school, you really have to, you know, they stress the extracurricular activities. You, there's not a lot else to do there when you're in boarding school. So you do a lot of clubs and sports and that kind of thing, whereas, you know, in college, a lot of kids don't really go down that track. Well, you know, I was looking for, for things to do other than just academics. And, I, and you know, I, I like to write. I like sports. So I went to, uh, you know, a an orientation for the, for the school newspaper at Georgetown. Got involved in, this, in writing sports very quickly. From there, uh, it kind of gravitated into a um, relationship you know, with, the, with the athletic department. Uh, they're called sports information directors in those days, which are now athletic communications. Got involved with that. I mean, again, this is 1973. You know, the sports information department at Georgetown was one person. Uh, you know, so I got involved in that as a student and got more and more responsibility. We, you know, as the basketball team got better, um, you know, we had a lot of different sports. We had Division three football. We had a really good track program. So I got more involved in that. And from there, I got a job, make through contacts, uh, working at the Washington Post, what was called a copy aid in those days. Uh, in my junior year, and I wrote high school sports for them, and and worked pro- and worked a lot more at the post than I did on my studies, uh, my last two <laughs> years in college, and that's kind of you know how it kind of all evolved. I just got more and more involved in different sports entities when I was in college, and you know, and still, you know, I don't, and I tell people this all the time. I interview students, you know, prospective students as part of the alumni interview program at Georgetown, and I wouldn't trade my degree in you know international politics for anything it was a great degree the professors were great i learned a lot and it's you know in government history those kinds of things have continued to be a passion but yeah going into it i I had no idea that this is how you know four years later it would end up all right so you mentioned working in the athletic department and and that's right around the time john thompson was establishing himself at Georgetown. And I don't know, I guess like college basketball fans who are maybe newer to college basketball probably don't really know a whole lot about John Thompson or recognize the the success and the tenure he had. But back when he was coaching, I mean, he was one of the, the, the legends of college basketball coaching. What was it like getting him before maybe he established himself in that way in the, the early part of John Thompson's coaching career as he was starting to find success well my freshman year at georgetown was his second year uh co- coaching the basketball team the year before he got there georgetown was three and 23 uh and they fired the athletic director they fired the basketball coach and, and the uh the president of the school at the time a jesuit by the name of robert henley you know made a Really went out there, and John. I mean, he hired a coach from from local St. Anthony's High School in Washington. Um, 
you know, it was uh, at the time it was a uh, certainly, you know, go, kind of going out there. It was 1972, and, you know, he was able to recruit and bring in student athletes from Washington, D.C., while also being able to give them a, a, a good education that was always very much a part of Coach Thompson's message. And as he grew the program, it, you know, I, I was very fortunate to be there you know, in the early days, you're exactly right. Because, you know, the thing people kind of remember about Georgetown and everything is you get farther down the line, farther away from that was Hoya Paranoia and how he was how he was tough on the media and how he kind of kept everything close to the vest. Well, you know, I was in that kind of that inner circle in the early part of it because he, he you know, he, he was, he trusted me. Um, I was always very supportive, uh, you know, and when in my in my writing with the school paper and everything, and it was some rocky times in his first couple of years uh, before the program really got started, and and that trust was was very important because it kind of led to my first, you know, full time job in the business, and you know, it's when I when I graduated uh, in 1977, I was you know the career path at that point was okay. I'm either gonna I'm going to look for a job, you know, in sports information at a college, or I'm going to look for a job, you know, as a sports writer in a paper or whatever. And I, that was the path, you know, and it was going to be whatever job I come up with first. You know, I was applying for things. I was still working at the Post, you know, pretty much full-time, but not full-time. And, you know, I was not going to get a full-time job at the Washington Post out of college in those days. Um, and I got very fortunate because the, the – the, the the SID that had kind of tutored and mentored me left in August after I graduated, and they made me the interim SID at 22. You know, of a Division One program with you know no help, no interns, no anything, um, and I proved myself. I got the I took they took the interim tag off in December, and a lot of that was due to my relationship. Uh, with Coach Thompson and the basketball staff, that they they trusted me, they had the confidence that a 22 year old which could do the job, which I'm not sure, you know, in this day and age it would probably never happen. Um, but you know, and I was able to to do some things there, grow the department a little bit, and um, you know, it was certainly a big break. And and I, to this day, I I, I owe that all to John Thompson. And it was fun to watch the basketball program kind of grow, fun to watch how he was able to grow it and, you know, ultimately go to three Final Fours in, in four years from 1982 to 85 and, and really put Georgetown on the map. Uh, and he was a great educator as well as a basketball coach. And uh, his legacy that lives on there today with, with Patrick Ewing, and you know, preceding, preceding his son is, is the basketball coach. All right, I, I don't remember if you told me this or if this is a Matt Hicks story because both of you guys have some some fun stories from when you were broadcasting. You used to do uh, some of the Georgetown games. Was it you who got ejected from a game as a broadcaster? Well, we got a technical foul. But, okay, a technical uh, foul. How, how did that get happen? ejected. What's that? Well, I mean, we, we had some good stories on, on, on basketball games. We, I mean, again, we, we had we, – I did. I was able to, you know, yes, I did. I did a lot of the color. I did some play-by-play uh, when the regular announcer wasn't there. And then the guy who's been doing games there for 47 years, a guy named Rich Shavatkin. And, and, and Rich is, the, and you, I'm sure you've heard highlights, Hoyas win, Hoyas win. He says it like nine times. <laughs> um, and Rich started, you know, when I was uh, – when I was a student, 1974 was the first time he did the games. And so I worked games with Rich a lot over the next 10 years before I, I came to Texas in 1984. So we did a lot of games together. Um, we had, uh, and in, in those days, um, you played in some very small gyms if you, when you were Georgetown. I mean, you played a lot of teams on the East Coast. They played in very small gyms, and, and you know we would we our our whole motto was, you know, you would go to these places and you'd get hosed, and you would you know by the referees, and when those teams would come to your place, 
In those days, McDonough Gym was about 3,200 students, and it would be a very similar thing. And, uh, you know, we would, uh, on the road, one of our favorite sayings was, you know, you would, your, your top guy would get three fouls in the first five minutes, and, you could, and you'd say, break out the raincoats, here comes the hose job. You know, we would say this stuff on the air, which uh, <laughs> couldn't really get away with that. So one night, I and I'm trying to run, run night, we were we were doing a game, and I got mad and yelled at a referee, and, you know, so before you know it, a guy teed me up. So it was, it was in one of these gym situations. So um, I, I was... Uh, in my youth, I, I tended to have be quite fiery on, on officials. <laughs> I mean, there, there, there is some. Uh, I went after an official one time. Uh, you know, and this was when I was a student. I went up and he started screaming at an official after a game. After I thought he cost us a game, had to get pulled off. So Thompson actually, I think, appreciated the support. <laughs> uh, all right. So after that, you you spent time with the Orioles and. Uh, I believe you got to work with Earl Weaver, who's one of the, I guess, baseball's great characters. What, what was that like? Yeah, I went from John Thompson to Earl Weaver. It was, uh, um, yeah. So, I, so I decided, basically, uh, I was yes, I did Georgetown about two and a half years, and at the time, you know, I'd been in, I'd been at, I'd been at Georgetown, you know, since I was a freshman, and I was just. I was kind of looking for a change. You know, I just didn't think I wanted to be a, a college SID at Georgetown, you know, my, for my uh, entire career. And um, job opens up, you know, as the assistant uh, PR director of the Baltimore Orioles in the spring of 1979 and applied for this job. And, I, you know, I first went through a couple rounds of interviews. First, I was told, well, I think we're going to go with more of a marketing Type because I mean again the staffs were very small you in those days and then they decided to go more hiring someone that had some some PR experience so uh, so I got that job I started in May of '79 the season had already had already started and um, you know working you know again I was about 23 years old and uh, working with Earl uh, he he was great to me I mean he he was again he was he was way ahead of his time on a lot of things in terms of managing, you know, keeping the famous Weaver cards, you know, where he would keep the batter pitcher matchups for all of his pitchers. We had to do that by hand. You know, we'd go through the scorebook and update his cards, you know, after every series. Um, we kept, we kept stuff like that. We kept uh, running percentage, throwing out runners. Nobody else did that. We kept save percentages and save opportunities. So I got a real experience working, you know, that club. And this is, this is a pretty good story. So I'd been there about three weeks, I think it is. And, um, the regular road traveling secretary and, and people know in baseball where teams travel so much, you have a person whose job is basically to, to be, to, to line up all the travel buses, you know, planes, the hotels, it's a full-time position. Josh Shelton does an excellent job for the Rangers now. But I'd been with the club about, I would guess, three weeks, and then the regular traveling secretary, who was a legend, he'd be, he was there forever and, and passed in 2010, a guy named Phil Itzo was, was one of the best. He couldn't make the road trip for some reason. So they tell, they tell me, okay, you're going to go on the road and, and, and do this traveling secretary, be the traveling secretary for this trip. Well, which I had no idea what I was doing because I had, you know, again, I'd been with a team literally less less than a month. So in those days, we would, you flew commercial a lot. So we, we you know, we flew commercial. I remember from Baltimore, to Detroit, get to the to the airport in Detroit, the bus wasn't there. That was the first first thing I said. This, may not, this wasn't going to go that great. So we get rained out, supposed to play the Tigers Friday night at Tiger Stadium. And uh, the game gets rained out, so we don't, you know, we don't play the game. We goes back to the hotel. So I get a call about three o'clock in the morning from from Weaver, and he goes, uh, he goes, yeah, you got to go down to uh, you got to go down to the Detroit City Jail and bail out Cal Ripken. <laughs> this is this Cal Ripken Senior, um, who had who had basically 
gone out that night, come back to the hotel, I guess, fallen asleep uh, in the lobby, and was uh, security person tried to wake him up, and Rip kind of came up swinging and everything and got thrown in jail for, for, I don't know if it was assault, I don't remember what it was. So three, so, I'm, so at 3 o'clock in the morning, again, first night on the road trip, I go down to the jail, I, and I have to bail Rip out. I you know, wrote a check off an account, which I don't think I had authorization to do, but I, but I, but I bailed him out. And so we go to the, you know, we have a game at the, we go to the ballpark, we have a day game, and um, Earl tells me, don't tell anybody this happened. Don't, just, you know, don't tell anybody or whatever. <laughs> okay, fine, you know, so Rip's got a big kind of cut on his nose. I mean, you, you know, something happened. But, uh, so it gets to be about the third inning, and and one and the writer from the Baltimore Sun comes up to me, and he goes, uh, "There's a there's a report out on the you know the police blotter that uh, that that Rip got thrown into jail last night or whatever, and was arrested and everything." <clears throat> so I have to go out of the dugout. This is the middle of the game. I get Earl out of the dugout. I say, uh, "This is out there," you know. And he goes, "He goes, well, you know." We'll have to uh, I'll have to go tell him to call his wife, and uh, calls his wife. It gets out. So that was my first night night on road trip. <laughs> oh man! But uh, when things got a little better from there, we played seventeen innings that day. So, so, <laughs> but, but, so that was uh, that was my first induction to a major league road trip. But but Weaver was great to me. He was always better, you know, when you were losing. Um, and you know he was easier to deal with when you were losing. When you were when the club was winning, and we won a lot, obviously, those years that he was the manager, he he was he was a little tougher to deal with. But I will say he was always he was always very accommodating to the writers. It was a uh, you know it was a fun time, and, and obviously the antics. And I'll tell one other Weaver story. Um, this was in spring training. Um, and I think it was 1981 or two. Um, and so we, geography wise, Ranger, the Orioles trained train in Miami in those days, uh, old stadium in, in Miami, very close to where the Marlins new state when Marlins stadium is now. Um, and we were going, we played a game in those days. You know, we would play the Royals were in Fort Myers, and it was a long bus ride. It was three and a half hours across the state. Uh, weren't a lot of interstates in those days. So we're in, we're in about the fourth inning of this game, and, for, and Earl is getting real agitated. I mean, the umpires have blown a couple of calls. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, he's up there, he's arguing with the umpire, and all of a sudden he pulls the team off the field in like the fifth inning, just pulls them off the field. And as he's walking off the field, he looks up to this little press box, and he sees me, and he goes, "Let's go, let's go." And uh, basically, we 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 got back on the bus, <laughs> <laughs> drove back to Miami, and we forfeited the game because uh, the umpire was not keeping all of the substitutions on his lineup card. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, uh, Bobby Brown, who I think was Bobby Brown at the time, was maybe still Lee McPhail, was president of the American League. Earl got suspended for this, uh, and there were no writers on the trip. That was the other thing I remember. It was, you know, it was so far that the, that the writers usually would just meet the bus back in Miami um, when we got back. So, you know, and obviously, you know, those are the days before cell phones, so I have to try to, you know, run, get a, on a pay phone and everything, call back, to Miami and just and, and tell uh, you know my boss or whoever it was, hey, you know, make sure the writers are there. We just forfeited this game, <laughs> and then for the next two or three days, Earl would sit in the press these little press boxes in spring training while he was serving <laughs> his suspension <laughs> with the writers. So that's just a couple of uh, couple of stories like uh, about Earl Weaver. But as I say, you know, he was a he was a great manager and. I got to go to a World Series my first year with the club in 79. Uh, we lost to the Pirates. We Are Family is not one of my favorite songs, obviously. Um, but then we, uh, you know, I got some uh, revenge in 83 when we won the World Series against the Phillies. All right, so 
not not to jump too far ahead, but then you you eventually come to Texas to work for the Rangers, and I understand your first day on the job there was a perfect game. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> so what was um, that like? Well, this was uh, okay. So I get the uh, I get the job in Texas in September of '84. Is right at the end of that season, and the last weekend of the '84 season, I came to Texas. It was kind of my, you know, indoctrination, my introduction or whatever to meet people and all that kind of thing. And on the last day of the season, the the, uh, the Rangers were, Mike Wynn of the Angels pitched a perfect game against them. Uh, it was the last game that the late Bert Hawkins served as, he was my predecessor as a PR director with the Rangers. He'd been doing it since the club started in Washington in 1961 covered the team for 30 years, covered the old Senators for 30 years before that. And this was his last game as the PR director officially. Um, Mike went through a perfect game in less than two hours on the final day of the 84 season. And uh, like a lot of other things, I, like a lot of other times, I've said to myself, well, I don't know what I'm getting into here. So, <laughs> All right, now, maybe one of those times – involved rick leach i heard a story i think you might have mentioned this at some point that rick leach in his one year with the rangers just was kind of missing one day and you had to go and track him down well i actually i mean we had to um and again this was 1989 we were in new york um and rick leach did not play a whole lot i mean he did not start that many games he happened to be in the lineup this one night uh, against the Yankees at old Yankee Stadium. And gets to be, you know, close to game time, uh, and no Rick Leach. Rick Leach hasn't shown up to the park. Um, so, you know, in a lot of days when Rick Leach wasn't in the lineup, you probably could have gotten away with nobody ever knowing he wasn't there. <laughs> but... Uh, so it gets to be, you know, uh, I guess we played at 7.30 in those days probably. It gets to be about 7.15, and then Bobby Valentine says, look, we got, you know, we, we, obviously we got Scratch Rick Leach. So to make the, the lineup change, um, and Bob Shepard has just started announcing the Ranger lineup. And he, and he goes, you know, number nine, Rick Leach. You know, left field. And I, like, go on the booth, and I say he's been scratched. And he goes, scratch that? <laughs> <laughs> Number 29, Peter Cavillia, whoever was starting that day. <laughs> so, um, so Rick Lynch went missing for two days. And, and, and in New York, uh, Tom Grieve, thank God Tom Grieve was the general manager, was on the trip. And Tom was actually the one that found Rick Lynch. And it was, I don't really want to get into the details, but uh, he got suspended and everything for uh, less, than, uh, more, less than great conduct. Um, but I'll never forget the Shepherd thing because it was, it was pretty. And, and again, if he hadn't been playing that day, I, I think you know, nobody would probably have known he was missing. <laughs> All right. Uh, I, I, again, there, there's so much that I guess we could cover with your career. I got one more just question of, of this ilk maybe a story type thing and then one question about the job itself but uh there was a i guess a pretty crazy period where under tom hicks's ownership you were not only just doing the rangers but i, I think you also had to oversee everything going on with the stars and this is while the stars were competing for stanley cups and even won a stanley cup what what was that how, how did that all come about and and I guess, what what was that period of time like? Um, well, you know, when Tom Hicks bought the Rangers in, in, in 1998, at that point, the star, you know, the, he had bought the Stars about five years earlier. And his, you know, the, his goal, his ambition was basically to start a, you know, kind of a sports organization with multi-teams uh, called Southwest Sports Group. And it, and it would encompass the Stars, the Rangers, the Mesquite Rodeo. He owned, he owned that, too, the Mesquite Rodeo. And so a lot of us were put into positions. We, we consolidated roles, you know. So 
even though I was still, you know, baseball was still what I was doing most of the time, I did have super oversight of both the stars, PR, community relations, that kind of thing. And then I had to do, you know, communications for the rodeo. Um, the, the, the kind of the bummer of the thing is, you know, in, in hockey, the, you don't get rings unless you win the Stanley Cup. And, and this arrangement did not start until after the Stars won in 1999. We actually started it for the next year. And then the next year, they lost to New Jersey in the finals. So never did, never did get a ring. But um, it was, you know, it was interesting, um, to say the least. I went to a, a, I didn't have to travel with, with the hockey. I went to a lot of home games. I went to, you know, the majority of the home games and, and did a lot of their corporate-type stuff. I didn't have to do that much team stuff. But, you know, at a time when the Rangers were, were fairly successful, you know, I mean, we were we were doing pretty well. Um, you know, there really isn't an off season to speak of anyway. But but in in this case, for the few years, you know, and that and that arrangement, they they decided in 2002, okay, this really isn't working. And we kind of went back to, you know, separate separate staffs. Um, but it made for some, you know, it made for some very busy off seasons and everything. But hockey players were great to deal with. I I, I did enjoy I did enjoy it from that perspective. All right, so I'm curious. Last last thing, John, uh, how do you balance your responsibility to the the players and the team to to protect them and look out for their interests while also uh, being fair to those covering the team, especially when they don't have glowing things to report, but you know they're not necessarily being unfair about it. I imagine that. Does that put you in a tough position sometimes? And how have you learned to to properly balance that? Because I imagine your your relationships with the players and the coaches and the trust is such a huge part. And I know some of these guys don't like seeing negative things written about them or, or said about them. Yeah, I mean, I think Jared, you always kind of walk that that line. Um, you know, I've always tried to be fair. I've always tried to be honest and transparent. Um, in our in the relationships, you know, with media and and, and public messaging and all of that. But you know, at the, at the at the when you when you boil it all down, and the bottom line is, you know, the first the first obligation, the first relationship is with the is with the organization you're working for, and 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 that trust is very important. And you know, I've always tried to you know in, in a different in situations where you know, the club maybe has been compromised or uh, things are not in a great light. You just do the best you can to try to, to, to put out the messaging and, and to try to be honest. I mean, that, that's what I've always tried to do. It's what I've always tried to tell, uh, you know, front office, players, managers, coaches, whoever it's been over the years, you know, just try to be as, as honest as you can, as, as forthright as you can, there are, obvi- there are obviously always going to be things you can't say or don't want to say. But at the end of the day, that's go- that's going to be the best approach. But uh, you know, my first obligation is, is going to be to is for the organization. I mean, that that's 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 the job is trying to put in, put your organization in this case the Rangers in the best light possible. And, you know, and that's, that's good and bad. There have been a lot of things over the years which, you know, have been tougher than others to, to, to try to work through and everything. But, uh, you know, overall, you know, I, I feel like I've, I've tried to do the best job I can. It, it always hasn't been perfect. But, uh, but, again, that's and I hope over the years I've been able to gain the trust of, you know, most of the people I've worked for.